Greetings in honor of Women's History Month 2022. The Black Faculty Task Force and Ethnic Studies Department of Delta College proudly bring you the Amari series. This is session three, Black Women Power. Kathleen Cleaver, Asata Shakur, and Denise Oliver Velez. In this session, we focus on the groundbreaking era of the Black Power Movement. In the 1960s and 70s, Black people who were unsatisfied with the lack of progress of civil rights, infuriated and fed up with the blatant racism, discrimination and injustice still being perpetuated against Black and Brown people in America, engaged in a movement of self-determination political and cultural organization, and self-reliance, which meant forming schools and developing community programs, educating and organizing the people about history and human rights, and taking a radical stance regarding self-defense by any means necessary. The backbone of the Black Power Movement were the women, the sisters who studied, organized, rallied, protested, volunteered, wrote, spoke, and risked their lives for the people. This session is dedicated to the women of the Black Power Movement. We simply cannot engage in a discussion about the Black Power Movement without acknowledging the sheer beauty of Black people. In 1962, a Harlem photo shoot captured the stunning poise, culture, and beauty of Black women in their natural state. The slogan for the show was Black is Beautiful. This brother here, myself, all of us were born with our hair like this, and we just wear it like this because it's natural, because uh, the reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among Black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance is beautiful and it's pleasing to them. For so many, many years, we were told that only white people were beautiful. Only straight hair, light eyes, light skin was beautiful. And so black women would try everything they could, straighten their hair, lighten their skin, to look as much like white women. Black is but this has changed because black people are aware. And white people are aware of it too, because white people now want uh, natural wigs. They want wigs like this. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> We will now explore the power and work of our first sister of honor, Kathleen Neal Cleaver. Kathleen Cleaver was born in Texas to prominent educators who took her around the world. Highly impacted by her worldly experience and highly dissatisfied with the state of America, she joined the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in college and became an activist of Black liberation. She married her fellow Black Panther, Eldridge Cleaver, and had two children, all the while as she emerged as one of the most influential leaders of the Black Panther Party. In a 1997 interview, Kathleen told Henry Louis Gates Jr. that the Black Panther Party's ability to implement self-determination and community control over education housing, business, and military service appealed greatly to her. She became a prominent spokesperson for the Panthers and created the position of communications secretary for the organization. She relentlessly organized, demonstrated, wrote, and spoke on behalf of the party. Thing I'd like to say about this whole question of violence that's been uh, bandied around, very clear should be made very clear that in the Black Panther Party and among all black people, it's not a question of violence, aggressive violence. This is what people mostly think of. It's a question of defending ourselves and our people against the violence that's being waged upon us and has been waged upon us for the past 400 years. It's a war of aggression 
is going on against black people, not only on the level of guns, but on the level of housing, on the level of education, on the level of uh, food, on every level of the society, there's aggression, there's hostility, suppression, and violence directed against black people. But the program of the Black Panther Party, originally started as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, is to move to defend and protect black people against this violence so that we can move to organize black people into a sufficient power to obtain our needs. Kathleen was determined to end the systemic violence and abuse black people continued to suffer in America, particularly at the hands of racist police and other non-humans, as she refers to them. She stood firm in her belief and upholding of self-defense and critique of the system. When asked about the role women played in the party, she always responded that they have the same role as the men. She was deeply inspired by women like Gloria Richardson, Diane Nash, and Ruby Doris Robinson, who led assaults on Southern segregation. She wrote a piece in 1998 reflecting the power of revolutionary women. Uh, this was the policy of Dr. Martin Luther King. He asked these people to move in their own self-interest. They refused. And secondly, uh, what you're asking is something that's human. And I don't think it's possible for this uh, establishment to react to a human problem in a human way. It's impossible. In terms of self-interest... think it's that inhuman? It is. It's obviously that inhuman to me. If you look at its history and what it's doing now, if that is human, then we're something else. So I have to assume that they're non-human. Kathleen, who lives on today to provide us incredible insight to her legacy and experience and to inspire us with her never-ending spirit and energy, critically pointed out one of the biggest obstacles to radical progress, which is the complacency and pacification of the masses who value financial stability, reward, and incentive over actual social revolution and change. To Kathleen, to be a true revolutionary is to put the people first. Our next sister of black power is the one and only Asata Shakur, who wrote, Nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Asata, meaning she who struggles, Olubala, meaning love for the people, Shakur, meaning the thankful, is a political activist, author, fugitive, and step-aunt to Tupac Shakur. She was born in New York City, and as a college student, she was strongly influenced into activism by black nationalist organizations. She participated in students' rights, anti-Vietnam War, and black liberation movements. When she traveled to Oakland in 1970, Asata became acquainted with the Black Panther Party. Inspired by their community work, she joined the party in New York City, where she worked in the Black Panther Party Free Breakfast Program for Children. After leaving the Panthers, Asata joined the Black Liberation Army, which was targeted by the FBI and labeled as an anarchist group. I think that it is important to make one thing very clear. I have advocated and I still advocate revolutionary changes in the structure and in the principles that govern the United States. I advocate self-determination for my people and for all oppressed people inside the United States. I advocate an end to capitalist exploitation the abolition of racist policies, the eradication of sexism, and the elimination of political repression. If that is a crime, then I am totally guilty. In 1973, Asata and two Black Liberation Army members were stopped for a traffic infraction. What ensued led to the death of a Black Liberation Army member and a state trooper. Asata was charged as guilty with first-degree murder, even though evidence pointed to her innocence. And in 1977, she was sentenced to life, plus 30 years in prison. 
To make a long story short, I was captured in New Jersey in 1973 after being shot with both arms held in the air and then shot again from the back. I was left on the ground to die, and when I did not, I was taken to a local hospital where I was threatened, beaten, and tortured. In 1977, I was convicted in a trial that can only be described as a legal lynching. In 1979, I was able to escape with the aid of some of my fellow comrades. I saw this as a necessary step, not only because I was innocent of the charges against me, but because I knew that the racist legal system in the United States, I would receive no justice. In 1979, Asata miraculously escaped from prison and fled to Cuba, where she was granted political asylum. She reunited with her daughter, Kakuya Amala Alubala, who was born while she was in prison. In 2013, the FBI placed Asata on the most wanted terrorist list, making her the first woman and second alleged domestic terrorist to appear on the list. Her bounty was set at $2 million. The condition of my people, my history, was very much connected with other oppressed people, and I began to see that they're the same foot that was on the necks of the Vietnam, Vietnamese people, that was on the necks of all oppressed people on the planet was the same foot that was on my neck. And so I began to understand that imperialism has to go. It is a poison that is killing people all over this world. The priorities of this planet have to be completely changed. And instead of profits, instead of uh, policies that destroy the earth, that destroy the water, that destroy human beings. I believe a policy that protects people, that makes people live in a, a community, a world community, that's what I believe. That's my basic political commitment at this moment. To this day, Asata Shakur continues to live in exile in Cuba. Her life and work has been depicted in countless songs, documentaries, and literary works. In her own words, no one is going to give you the education you need to overthrow them. Nobody is going to teach you your true history, teach you your true heroes, if they know that that knowledge will help set you free. It is our duty to fight for our freedom! It is our duty to fight for our freedom! It is our duty to win! It is our duty to win! We must love each other and support each other! We must love each other and support each other! We have nothing to lose but our chains! 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 All power to the people! All power to the people! Our final feature and sister of Black Power is Denise Oliver Velez. Denise Oliver Velez is a New York-born political activist, feminist, journalist, community organizer, educator, and anthropologist. She was involved in civil rights, women's and AIDS activism movements, and was a member of both the Young Lords Party and the Black Panther Party. She was a Minister of Economic Development for the Young Lords Party, a Puerto Rican civil rights group active in New York City in the 1960s and 70s. She became the highest ranking woman in the organization and fought for women's rights and equality amongst the ranks. Denise was highly influenced by powerful and strong women in her family, community, and the world beyond. Her family brought her up in a culture of self-defense and women's rights. Like Kathleen and Asata, Denise was exposed to radical student organizations on the college campus. She also became involved with the SNCC and began studying the practice of armed self-defense for the people. 
coming from a family history of relatives who survived the wickedness and violence of the KKK, Denise followed suit. The Young Lords Party modeled their programs after the Black Panthers, and the two groups worked in collaboration to develop free breakfast programs and advocacy for housing, tenant, community, and health issues throughout New York City. She mentions that at the time, there was not yet a name for environmental racism, yet they identified it and thought it just the same. Denise worked on Palante, the Young Lord Party's newspaper publication, and also on the Black Panther Party's paper as well. She traveled extensively to spread the word and increase solidarity for the cause of Black power. She also became the first executive director of the Black Filmmakers Foundation. A lot of the community wasn't necessarily totally literate so we tried to use art to communicate the politics that we were, were working with in the community at the time. Denise was the highest ranking woman at the time, but like many women who were active in the Young Lords, she felt frustrated by the sexism within it. That machismo should be revolutionary and not oppressive. And, uh, well, that's an oxymoron. There is no way that machismo can ever be revolutionary. It's like saying revolutionary racism or, you know, revolutionary xenophobia. The women made demands and they were met. They were elevated to leadership positions and the platform was revised. We want equality for women, down with machismo and male chauvinism. We Denise was particularly aware and concerned about the role and treatment of women in the Young Lords Party, and she became critical of the all-male machismo leadership of the organization. Her voice and perseverance led the party toward profound progress and change regarding its attitude about and treatment of its invaluable female members. Denise's advocacy for women demanded that they be granted high and important positions on their central committee and central staff. She was the first to be put on. That five people can get together in an apartment or on a campus and decide to start a movement that can change the world. And you don't have to be, you know, funded to do it. You don't have to go take a course on how to do it. You know, you just have to have the commitment and the desire for change, and it can happen. Denise Oliver Velez continues to motivate and inspire the young and old, providing interviews and presentations that teach and empower others to get involved. She cautions, however, that we never become too elite as professionals that we lose touch with the people of the movement. She warns of the danger of academic space as being too convoluted and bougie and tells us, my dad taught me that if you cannot communicate directly to your grandmother and your grandmother cannot understand you, if you have a PhD in English literature and your grandmother cannot understand what you are talking about, you've failed. The following slides contain suggestions for lessons that you can implement in your own courses with your students. For example, you can propose the following prompts for students to discuss in small or large groups, or to write to, or to serve as the basis for future research. This lesson activity focuses on even more Black women leaders of the civil rights movement and poses questions for students to help them analyze their contributions and struggles, to help explain their influences of motives, beliefs, and actions, and the impact that they had on historical events, to analyze multiple perspectives, and to differentiate between historical facts and interpretations. This lesson suggestion focuses on women of color in American politics and provides detailed background along with a materials and resources bank that has a wealth 
of books, articles, videos that students can use to help guide them through the lesson, as well as differentiated questions for every grade level, including college, to help stimulate writing and discussion. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom.